Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Camdlestick, the provocateur. Oh, that was beautiful. That was Thank beautiful. You. Thank well you. Done. Now, Scott, I have a question for you. Oh. Were you nice looking when you were young? I I had a, a note about this young thing because <laughs> I, they they allude that you stop being young when you're 32, and both of us are well past 32. <laughs> well in the rearview mirror. But I mean, I guess in those days, people did look quite old when they were young. Sure. I just felt it was a bit of a personal attack when they brought up the guy's age. He's like, oh, well, I'm well past it now. I'm definitely over 32. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> What happened to my youth? The specter of death was tugging at your uh, pant legs. Yes, it, it certainly was. Um, but let's talk about these candlesticks, sticks, Cam. What are we talking <laughs> about this week? We are tackling the 1937 espionage comedy The Emperor's Candlesticks, starring William Powell and Louise Rayner. Now, I think it's important to note, I mean, we could excise this, but... Yeah, with the magic of podcasting. But this wasn't originally our planned film this week. No, it wasn't. We had a separate rendezvous planned. Yes, we certainly did have a separate <laughs> rendezvous planned, and that's another film that we're looking to tackle. It does have the same lead actor, which we will talk about. But uh, yeah, we, we I couldn't get a hold of a copy of the film, so we had to shelve that one for now. It's going to go onto our back burner for a little while. But I'm uh, I'm I'm keen to uh, to polish these candlesticks. Yeah, we were going to talk, uh, just to make it a little more clear, uh, the movie Rendezvous from 1935, starring William Powell. And it's widely available in North America, but not so much in the UK. So we wanted to pick something that everyone could kind of watch. And The Emperor's Candlesticks, while not heavily streaming anywhere, is on YouTube for everyone. Yeah, YouTube seems to be like the magic bullet when it comes to these things, because Rendezvous at one point was on YouTube, and so we were like, oh, okay, I mm. can at least watch it on YouTube, and everyone in the UK can do the same. North America, you can you can rent it. Whereas now, that it, it disappeared. So Emperor's Candlesticks is definitely available on YouTube. We have a copy. If people need it, let us know. Um, and so, yeah, I guess this is what we're going to do. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we are down to grapple with these candlesticks. <laughs> Let's let uh, let let's do that, Cam. Let's polish them up real nice. Now I know, <laughs> I know you've never heard of this film. I had never heard of this one. I'm quite familiar with William Powell. Do you want to know why I know you've never heard of this film? Why is that? Because it wasn't even on our list of films. That is also true. This is one that has slipped through the cracks because if you look it up on Letterboxd, like 20 people have watched it. It is uh kind of a little bit lost to time when we dive into the people involved it's kind of a surprise and i mean william powell as i was just saying like i'm very familiar with because he was the star of the thin man series him and myrna loy back in the 30s and 40s those movies were massively popular he was one of those guys who was just like one of the top studio kind of light comedy guys and so you can see like him in movies like uh, my man godfrey and things like that so i've seen him in a number of movies also the 1936 Best Picture winner, The Great Ziegfeld, which is uh, not great, but he's the star of that movie and very uh, engaging in the movie. One of those big movie stars of like the 30s, 40s, who I feel like people don't really remember now. Like, I don't expect every person to have seen 30s, 40s movies. But if you say mention the name Errol Flynn or James Cagney, people might go, oh, I, I know that name. Whereas if you say William Powell, I think you're going to get blank stares. When I think of the word, the name Powell, I think of like Powell and Pressburger, that sort of thing. I don't think of this sure. chap. I don't know if there's any connection there at all. No. No. So, yeah, it, 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 I mean, everyone knows all these films are basically new to me anyway. But yeah, I was surprised that you hadn't heard of it, but at least you know the lead actor. And I think we'll we'll get into maybe some of the granular about the the talent behind this film. There seems to be quite a lot of talent from what I've read. But as Cam and I have never heard of this film, I'm sure you lovely people listening at home haven't either. Here is your exceedingly brief letterbox.com synopsis. <laughs> the Emperor's Candlesticks. Drama that will toy with your heart. 
spies on opposite sides fall in love in pre-revolutionary Russia. Okay. Uh, sure. I mean, that could be like any, you know, th I'm sure there's dozens of movies that would fit that uh, criteria. I think British agent Secret kind of falls. agent. Yeah, British agent, sorry. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, that t is that film, almost. Just think about what is left out of that synopsis. The kidnapped Russian Grand Duke? Meh. The, uh, I don't know, MacGuffins of the title? Who cares? And the top secret papers? Whatever. Also, like, would you say this is a drama? There's, there's definitely dramatic elements. It feels a little light and a little more comedic to me. I guess it's maybe comedy drama? Yeah, I'd say, well, there's definitely a comedy element to this film. There's, yeah. there's actual, like, jokes and stuff. There's, a, there's, a, there's at least two characters that are designed for comedy. Yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't call this a straight drama. At, at least a dramatic comedy or, or, or a comedy spy film. Yeah. Yeah, like, it feels a little frothy, a little, yeah. kind of like, we want people to have fun and take in the romance of these two leads. It's pulpy. It's, like, yeah. I don't know why you think it's a straight, this is not a straight thriller. I would say Confidential Agent, like, that was a drama. Yeah, it was more of a laugh that we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, the, and, and what, the price of coal. Yeah, yeah, that, that deserved the meeting. <laughs> I do love that some of these old ones we tackle bring up topics that you and I are just like, uh, we're going to have to do some research on that one. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, don't even get me started on research when it comes to this film. Uh, actually, I'm going to get into it. But uh, Cam, I'm genuinely curious. How did the Emperor get these candlesticks? Well, this film was based on a popular book from 1899 by Baroness Amuska Ortsi. And um, she was probably better known. She was a Hungarian-born British novelist uh, and playwright who wrote the Scarlet Pimpernel series of novels that were incredibly popular, you know, tied to the French Revolution, these sort of like, you know, kind of escapade, caper kind of stories. And um, mm -hmm. she really made her name off those. But this was another one of her books. And her full name was Emma Magdalena Rosalia Maria Joseva Borbala Orsi de Orsi. Frank, Jimmy, Hank. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of names. It is a lot of names. And when I saw that, I was like, I have to read those out because how yes. do you not? <laughs> I, a part of me, like the ego of me, would like want to have my book have that full name on the front, just mm. one copy so I, I own it. Mm hmm. Yeah. But alas, that was not meant to be. But tell me more. Yeah, so MGM snapped up the rights to this book. And there was actually also an Austrian version that was also made and released the year before this called Die Lukter des Kaisers. Um, and I wow, well again. done, Cam. Well done. That's, that, that sounded <laughs> that okay? almost authentic. Yeah, that, was, uh, that was, wasn't horrible. Yeah, so it was released about a year before this movie, but that was a separate production. Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you, Cam. I've just received a communique from the Austrian government. You are now banned from the country. Fair enough. Well deserved. Well deserved. Um, but uh, that production had nothing to do with this one, other than they actually reused some footage from that movie in this one, some location shots, and a scene of characters jumping on a train. Uh, that stuff was taken from that 1936 film. I wonder why that looks so weird. Mm-hmm. That's why. Was also the luggage being thrown out the window from the same shot? Because that made no sense in this film. Probably, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So the director of this movie was George Fitzmaurice, who we talked about previously. Scott, do you remember what spy film he directed that we covered at length on this podcast? So it's a spy film. He directed a spy film that we've covered. Yes. From the 30s. In the 30s. Okay, so it's not like any of the Hitchcock ones, obviously. Nope. I'm going to go. No, that's in the 40s. Mata Hari? That's the one, ding, 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 yeah. from 1931. So he got his career start in 1914 with the film When Rome Ruled, uh, which if you look up the synopsis on IMDb, it's about, oh, I don't know, 300 words. <laughs> it's very long. Sort of a uh, Roman epic with a lot of themes of Christianity. Yeah, and of course you were his teacher in kindergarten as well. Exactly, that that is true. More, uh, Fitzmaurice was one of my prize students. Um, he also directed, um, in 1917, a spy film. 
1917. Yeah, called Sylvia of the Secret Service. Is that going on the list? I can't find it anywhere. I looked. I was like, oh my god, we could do a 1917 movie, but as of current, it remains lost. <laughs> it might be somewhere out there. We need an archive somewhere to uh, put it out there. Well, I mean, I've become sort of fascinated recently with lost media. It's actually quite a fun thing to explore. So uh, I'll take the details down of that film and have a little dig into it. And I might uh, call on our agents out there to have a little search with us, see if we can uncover this uh, potential gem. It could be the crowning jewel, the true emperor's candlestick on the (laughs) mantelpiece that is the knocklist. Maybe, maybe. And so in 1937, he'd also done a movie called The Last of Mrs. Cheney. Um, which was also uh, co-starring William Powell. And he rolled right from that movie into this one. And this comes pretty close to the end of his career. He would direct 1940s Adventures in Diamonds and die that same year at the age of 55. So he was quite a busy chap. He was, yeah. But like 19, uh, going back to that 1917 film you were talking about for a second, Mm. uh, what what do films look like at this point in 1917? Uh, I, I assume black and white. Silent, yeah. And they're silent, okay. Okay, interesting. Right. Gives me something to look for. But yeah, I mean, would that have made him about like 60 when he died? Something like that? 55. Okay. Well, according to this film, that basically dead and buried at that point. Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, so he had a couple writers um, on it, on this film. The first was Harold Goldman, who um, got his start. In 1936, with the movie Petticoat Fever, he um, had a very short career, really, but he uh, co-wrote Petticoat Fever that was directed by Fitzmaurice, and that movie starred Robert Montgomery, who's in this movie, as well as Myrna Loy, and he also had a dialogue credit on the Gene Harlow film Personal Property, and then he rolled right into this film, and he really didn't do much else other than his final credit was a dialogue and construction credit. For uh, 1948's The Big Clock, which was remade as da, 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 No Way Out, which we covered on the show. Wow, it is all connecting. These spy films are all connecting. And mm-hmm. I mean, where do you go after Emperor's Candlesticks? Like, you've reached the precipice. From the candlestick to the clock. I wish I had a funny pun to follow that up with, but I don't. <laughs> the other writer was Moncton Hoff who was a writer and playwright who uh, made his sort of big movie debut with 1916's The Little Demosel, and then mostly just worked on studio films. He did some uncredited work on the 1935 William Powell film Rendezvous. (laughs) It's all connecting. I love this. We're doing the behind the scenes on Rendezvous without even trying. That's right. And he did pair up with Fitzmaurice on The Last of Mrs. Cheney the same year as this film. So uh, they rolled right from that project into this movie. And he would go on to collaborate also again with Harold Goldman, the other writer of this movie, on Haunted Honeymoon, starring Robert Montgomery. And he would maybe most famously co-write in 1941 The Lady Eve with Preston Sturges, which is one of the greatest screwball comedies of all time. One thing I find interesting when we're looking back on these sort of 30s films is the, uh, we're just discussing it, the interconnective sort of nature of it all. It does just, you know, when you speak to like grandparents and parents and like, back in my day, I could leave one job and then walk next door and get a new job, different place. And it's all like super easy, barely an inconvenience. Mm. That seems to be the way it is in Hollywood. Like, you could just walk off the set of uh, Rendezvous and then just walk on to the Emperor's Candlesticks and be like, oh, spy film? Okay, sure. Yeah, well, it's also like Hollywood is a much smaller community back then. And so there's so much intermingling on projects that that's what makes it really interesting when you go to do research on some of these older movies where you just dig up so many interesting connections, especially with spy stuff. Like, there's so many crossover spy films that we've tackled. I I, uh, was genuinely hoping that Romeo would show up in Matahari. (laughs) Well, you know. She could have done with that mask, to be fair. That's true. That's true. That movie needed like a masquerade scene. I'm surprised it didn't have one. That that masquerade... Actually, we'll come back to the masquerade scene because that's that's a fun one to talk about. Yeah. And just uh, Moncton Hoff uh, closed out his career in 1956 with The Birds and the Bees, which co-starred David Niven 
another uh, actor that spy fans may know, who was, of course, Ian Fleming's choice to play James Bond. Oh, the ultimate James Bond, of course. Mm. Of course, uh, of course. Yeah, you know, he, uh, he he plays his Debussy in the afternoons. He, yeah, that's that, that's the best way to be a, a James Bond. That's right. And so, like, MGM really saw this movie as a big project. They dumped huge amounts of money into it. They wanted this to be an A picture. And so, like, they were courting stars. William Powell, as I said, was a huge star at the time. And um, they originally wanted Gloria Swanson to play the female lead she would many years later play the lead in um sunset boulevard which is one of the all-time great you know uh, performances but she uh dropped out of this movie and so they went to louise rayner and louise rayner um there's some interesting background with her so she launched her career in 1935 she'd come over from uh, germany and had co-starred with William Powell in the movie Escapade in 1935 and immediately got attention. And she repaired with him for The Great Ziegfeld the next year and won the Best Actress Oscar. And then in 1937, she you know signed to do this movie and replace Gloria Swanson and go opposite Powell for this movie. But at the same year, she also did a movie called The Good Earth, which she won another Best Actress Oscar having back-to-back wins. Uh, so like she was one of these people who fairly early in her career was like, this is the next big thing. Back to back wins. The future is bright for Louise Rayner. And I haven't seen the good earth. It's, I have a list of best picture nominees that I need to watch. It's one that's going to take some time because it's a two and a half hour drama about Chinese farmers. Yeah. Yeah. But let's be fair. Avatar, the way of water is a three hour and 15 minute about. I don't know. Fish? Scott, take a second. Take a second and think. Louise Rayner won Best Actress. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm now, you know, in Sapatico with you. When we struggled with Rendezvous, me and Cam were sort of scrambling to find a new film. I was looking through our master list, and there was a film from the 30s. I'm not going to name it, because I can't remember. I was like, oh, okay, 1930s. And it was available to stream. Available on YouTube, I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then I read, oh, okay. Basically, someone pretends to be like a... It basically is in blackface the entire film. Yeah. The main character. I'm like, oh, I don't know if we can ever talk about this one. Yeah. So, yeah, The Good Earth is one that is very much been forgotten as a Best Picture nominee from that year. It's Paul Mooney is also the, the co-lead of that film. Huge, huge studio prestige drama of the time i think it's like two and a half hours um but has obviously aged like moldy bread it's it's a tough one because you know our journey and our goal is to watch all the spy films maybe that's something we'll have to try and get over at some point and talk about it in like a sensible and you know I, it's it's weird because it's it's not a subject i feel like i can really take apart and i'll i won't even be reviewing it very well because it's ultimately abhorrent and it's also difficult because you're asking people who listen to the show to watch these movies to kind of, you know, join the discussion in their own way with the podcast. Mm. And yeah, it's a real ask for some of these really outdated ones. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at you, one of our dinosaurs is missing. <laughs> and so, yeah, like she signed on and began production on this movie like very, very shortly, mere days after winning the second Best Actress Oscar. And they rushed this movie through post-production to capitalize on her win. Because they were like, this woman just won a second Oscar. Get this movie out because she is going to be a huge star. And really what happened was this movie, you know, the box office was fine. I'll get to that in a second. But she had a string of failures and her career was basically dead by the end of 1938 when she was booted off MGM's roster. And like kind of that was it for her acting career. She has a few little, you know, TV and whatever spots over the next couple decades she did a bunch of theater but her time as a movie star was over as of 1938 what a weird fall from grace yeah i mean i guess in some ways she you know won the battle ultimately she died at the age of 104 in 2014 so she lived a very long you know happy life but uh yeah in terms of like hollywood stardom not it was not meant to be i guess yeah, that, that's a shame. I mean, I'll I'll get to my thoughts on her in this film in a bit, but 
just I, I, I wonder what happened politically behind the scenes that caused her to lose that sort of star because I don't know if her acting skills got any better or worse. No, I would have to imagine it was like bad scripts. Yeah, but it's also like at that time too. If the producer, I can't remember if it was Louis B. Mayer overseeing MGM at this point. I think it was. Maybe wrong, but um, if they didn't like the actor on their contract or they had personality conflicts or something, they would put them in bad movies to basically show the world, like, see, see, you don't want to like trust in these people. Because I just have a, a certain sense that, like, if they really believed in her as a talent, they wouldn't have bo- uh, booted her one year after winning her second Best Actress Oscar. Sequentially as well. Like, it really was her time. It's really weird. And, like, people and people in, in at least in modern day, go four or five years between their films and then they get acclaimed for it. Like, you don't see a Tom Cruise film every year. You don't see a um, what's a chap who has really young girlfriends every year. Uh. <laughs> that's that's like half of Hollywood, Scott. Be more specific. Um, Titanic. Oh, DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. DiCaprio. Yeah, like he doesn't do a film every year. But they're also independent contractors, right? Like whereas in these days, you were on a contract to a studio. The studio owned you. That that explains our relationship. It does very much so. I, I mean, I, it's odd she wasn't picked up by another studio. Like, I just have to believe MGM somewhat blacklisted her as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So this movie had a budget of six hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Domestically, it did seven hundred and thirty-three thousand. International, six hundred thousand for a worldwide total of one point three three million dollars. Which, you know, that's like basically double the budget. Um, so it's odd because if you look it up online, some people say it was like a modestly successful movie and then others are like, oh, a real dog, real box office bomb. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know what box office wanted at that point. I know mm-hmm. they always say like you double it now and then you're in the money, but I don't know if marketing was the same back then. I think if you made your money back, you were doing well. But also I wonder too, like the 600,000 international when was this movie released internationally? Because they didn't typically release them day and date back in those days. It could even be like two years later it was playing international. I can somewhat answer that question for you, although not very specifically. Yeah. It came out in 1937, July 2nd, in the USA. And then sporadically over the next year... Uh, yeah, so by mid to. By mid-1938, it was still coming out overseas. I don't know where the UK release was. Yeah. But rest assured, it came out in Singapore in 1945. Holy smokes. Yeah, because back in those days, movies didn't open in you know 3,000 theaters over the course of one weekend. They would take a long time to roll out. So this movie could have been opening years, like a couple years later in the you know UK or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I imagine... Looking at the year, I mean, two years later, the UK was getting pretty busy, and so was the rest of Europe. Yeah. So we would have had time for it. Yeah, no kidding. Um, And so the top three for this year, I just have the domestic total, because the worldwide top three gets uh, very confusing to try to figure out for a 1930s movie. Number one was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, obviously, which was basically the avatar of its time. Uh, number two was Saratoga, which was a romantic comedy with Clark Gable and Gene Harlow. And number three was Maytime, starring Jeanette MacDonald, which was about an aging opera star looking back on her life. Well, it's not venereal diseases or Bible <laughs> the beginning, so I'll take it. Do you think this movie about the aging opera star, do you think she's like 32 looking back at her life? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so cold. Why is it so cold? Since I turned 33. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I, uh, I, I, there's like four different notes in my, four different points in my notes about the whole age thing. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy, Ken. <laughs> yeah. And, and also crazy that, uh, I feel so, I, I, I am in so much pain in the morning these days. <laughs> it only gets worse. Trust me. Oh, God. Oh, brother. Well, Cam, let's light this sucker and brighten our way into a review of the Emperor's Candlesticks. It was a very short notice review, of course, but we've done our best. I even managed two viewings. I'm quite proud of myself in the space of Whoa. one. Yeah, I was... I, I mean, I'm glad. I mean, I put the plural in Emperor's P- Candlesticks. 
I mean, I guess when the movie's 89 mo- uh, minutes, that makes it a lot easier. I, well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, I could watch two of these in the space it took me to watch Avatar the other day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Less, actually, because Avatar's like three hours, ten minutes or something. So I, I could sneak in... Hmm. I, I could sneak in the Goldfoot mini-movie as well, I guess. But why would you? Well, why would you? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, but let, let's get down to it. Emperor's Candlesticks... Do you know what? I quite like this film. Yeah? I think it was quite jaunty, quite like, ew. It was fun. It, was, it wasn't It was exactly very well paced. I think the plot was a bit muddled. I think uh, there was a bit of pre-reading or like knowledge of the time of geopolitics <laughs> that you should probably know going into this film. <laughs> Like, you'd need to know that there, that there never used to be countries in between Russia and Poland, the Eastern right. Bloc as it is, I suppose. That used to all be Russia, because the whole like, trip between Poland and Russia is meant to be going through. Anyway, there's lots of things that sort of drag down my overall score if I was going to score the film, but it, in like a holistic sense, I had a good time with it. I think William Powell, I don't know how I've never heard of the chap, because mm. he's a great actor. Yeah. Every time he's on the screen, I'm drawn towards him. He's funny. He seems warm and kind, and you want to just sort of be around him. I'm not so hot on Louise Rayner, I have to say. I mean, she's got the biggest eyes in Hollywood, I think. Yeah, it's like anime eyes. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah. But uh, she didn't work for me as much, I have to say. But I think overall, I had a good time with it. What about you? I enjoyed this one, too. It's, like, very fizzy. Uh, yeah. You can't get hung up on the plot details too much like the the mechanics of these candlesticks getting you know sent all over the place where are they what yeah. country are we in who cares <laughs> i couldn't even keep track of the countries i'm like what is going on in this movie there was a point honestly like and this is where this is not a perfect movie it's very much sold on just kind of the high energy the uh the chemistry between William Powell and Louise Rayner, and I think they genuinely work together quite well. Sure. And just sort of like the escapade nature of this story, like that carries you through the movie. And 89 minutes is a godsend. The movie's pretty zippy. I didn't feel like, for example, when we talked about British Agent, that one had some real pacing dead spots. Like some of the romantic stuff in that movie just ground it to a halt. Whereas I felt like here... The movie balanced its comedy and its romantic scenes very well. The only thing was, when it came to the actual storytelling, there was a couple points where I was getting rather lost and had to like pause, look at the Wikipedia synopsis, and be like, "Okay, okay, I, I think I, I think I understand." And as you said, the geopolitics of the time, trying to figure those out, a little complicated. I will say, British agent kind of depended on you knowing them. Mm -hmm. Whereas this movie, if you don't, it doesn't really matter. You can kind of just go along with it. I I would agree, but I think at least British Agent gave you, like, title cards. Mm, Yeah. Like, too many. (laughs) Four score and seven years ago, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) And that was fine. But in this, it was very much like, oh, yeah, Poland, am I right? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, brother. Are you right? <laughs> uh, I, I I can't really rag on it too much because they're not making this film for me. Right, they're making it for audiences in 1937, so I can forgive that. And I think I, I agree with like the romance working a lot more. I mean, this film starts off with this like huge masquerade ball. Yeah, it feels like there's so much money been spent on this set. There's hundreds of extras in this ballroom. Uh, it's and it's constant motion in the background. There's a lot going on, and there's this like really fun story that actually embeds itself throughout the rest of the film, which is, is these two people that have a connection to each other. It's like it's Romeo and Juliet in this moment. Who I think one's meant to be a prince or something, and then and then the other <laughs> one's a spy, I think, or like a femme fatale. He was a baron, I think. He was a baron, but he was like the son of the the head of Russia, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Tsar. The Tsar, thank you. Not a term they use anymore. But so he, that, that was their connection, and it was like a, a, a tryst between them, and they were playing off on sort of the Romeo and Juliet stuff. But that really, that theme flows throughout the film because you've got 
these two spies whose life becomes interconnected to each other. You've got the two candlesticks. There's a lot of things about pairs and twos in this film, which I, I think is quite nice. It's obviously a lot of thoughts gone into the story. And that that's a really great kickstart. You actually compare that to Confidential Agent. No, British Agent, sorry. There's a lot of agents in this decade. I'm sorry, folks. I get confused. And there will be more. There's more. There will be more. I think we, I think there's a movie called Espionage Agent we'll be tackling at some point, too. And there's at least one secret agent as well, which I think is a Hitchcock film, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that there's, there's a few. Uh, but Confidential Agent, I should say. Wait, was that right? Which agent is I it? So. It's Confidential Agent. <laughs> Starts off with a big ball as well, a big gala. Oh, no, that's British agent. Oh, my God. <laughs> so British agent has a big gala at the start. I think I'm right. But it's nowhere near as kinetic as this film. And I was like, oh, this is a really cool cool way of starting this off. And it introduces us to both of you know the you know, Baron Wal- Walensky, William Powell's character, Countess Miranova, Louise Rayner's character as well, who are acting on either side of this Russia-Poland split. But for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why anyone was doing anything with anyone else. Like it was, that was battling. Yeah, what I liked was you set it up there. Like the way the movie introduces us to the Robert Young and Marino Sullivan characters right off the top in that masquerade, um, playing Romeo and Juliet there. They set up like the B story of this kind of, you know, star crossed lovers, you know, agents from both sides in their own way. And then they play that with the A story. So you kind of have these two romances going on at the same time. Mm-hmm. And both with people that look kind of similar. <laughs> like the men both have the same mustaches. The women both have like the dark hair. Um, with li- little bobs and stuff. Like it's, yeah, you could, it'd be hard to, to sort of pull them apart. I think it, that would be, yeah. Uh, I, I, that has to be a choice, I guess. It was the style at the time. <laughs> I think that may be part of it. Sure. But I like the way that it was setting up like these two kind of like bubbly romances at the heart of this movie. I would have honestly liked more with the one that's set up at the masquerade because you only really get a couple scenes between the two of them over the course of the movie. And Maureen O'Sullivan, um, who was someone who I know very well because she was a uh, Jane in the early Tarzan films with Johnny Weismuller and really iconic in those. So more of her is always a great thing. But I like the way this movie had like that real playful kind of tone to it that it set up very quickly and efficiently at that masquerade. Also, some fantastic filmmaking. There is a shot where Fitzmaurice and his camera operator are shooting like these sort of Polish conspirators up, um, looking down at the dance, you know, the dance floor. And then it like the camera pans all the way down and does a close up of the dancers on the floor. And I thought like that moment was really cool. It's not a flashy movie. This is not a Hitchcock go for broke, come up with like whiz bang sequences, but there's some really elegant work going on here. It it feels like they had a vision and they were trying to stick to it. There's another shot, I think where they track up the stairs of like a a revolving staircase. Uh, It's throw away really. Like if you're not paying attention, you wouldn't really see the shot, but it reminded me a lot of the Notorious shot coming down the staircase to the Unica Key. I thought, this is really stylized filmmaking, and someone spent a bit of time and care. And one thing I always get in my head about films from this era in the 40s is they were very much like just throwing them out. Just print it, print it, print it, get the film out, let's move on to the next one. Whereas this one feels like it had some some care. Yeah. Which baffles me when you talk about the behind the scenes and that no one's heard of this film. Yeah. I mean, MGM was known for the production values, especially when you go a little more into the future. Although, you know, they're going to put out Wizard of Oz, like, you know, two years after this movie. But they are going to become really famous for their big Technicolor musicals and things like that. Like, MGM became the brand that was, like, kind of like safe family entertainment. Like, they didn't really dabble in edgy material very often, but they made their movies look just like a million bucks. And here, yeah, that, I'm glad you mentioned that staircase scene where it's um, it's Louise Rayner's character going up the stairs and the way it crosses with a William Powell's character, that's kind of their first moments where they see each other. Mm-hmm. And it's really flashy and like interesting to look at. You know, very simple, but like very effective. But that, that had to be quite a hard shot to achieve. And that made me think like someone came into this production with a vision. It wasn't very it wasn't just like, hey, uh, okay, so there's two people meeting in a in a room. Okay, let's go. 
it's it it had some thought behind it, and that's what I appreciated. Yeah. Well, it's funny you should mention Wizard of Oz. Did you know this film has a connection to Wizard of Oz? Yes. Uh, Frank Morgan pops up in this movie as a colonel who is uh, kidnapped alongside Robert Young's character. And uh, yes, he played the Wizard of Oz himself in that film. It's interesting. Only him and Ian Wolfie, who I might mention later on, uh, are the only two actors on IMDb that have color images. Yeah. On their like uh, like profile photos, everyone else is black and white because these two guys went on to do other things afterwards, I guess. But yeah, I uh, definitely remember from Wizards of Oz. But uh, he also has quite a memorable turn in this film as uh, well as Colonel Baron Suroff, but uh, constantly worried. He definitely wins our retired Uramov Award. <laughs> this character, I did spend a certain amount of time going, like, who is this guy and why is he involved in this movie? <laughs> but he's fun. He is fun. He's like he's like the the Baron's bodyguard or something like that. I guess, I guess that's what it is. Oh, sorry, the Grand Duke's bodyguard. He's a Baron. I guess so. Yeah, that that that. Uh, and he's he, and so like he's meant to look after the Grand Duke. So him losing the Grand Duke makes him nervous and worried throughout the entire film that he's going to get sent to Siberia. That's right. That's the big concern. Yeah, Siberia. Yeah. Which uh, even even in the 1930s, that was something to avoid. You don't want to end up in a gulag. <laughs> No, you do not. That is not a pleasant place to be. It's funny, though, to me, when we look at these spy films of this like 1930s period, which we've tackled a couple, how often they touch on Russia and like Russian locations, which is not something you encounter when you get to spy movies a little bit later. Like you get a lot of Cold War stuff for sure, but you don't have mm-hmm. as movie as many movies set within very specific time periods using a lot of kind of the historical knowledge of Russia that these movies have. Well, I know in recent times people have pulled away from making very topical comments for fear of enraging certain communities. But, yeah, it's something that has definitely moved away. You look at Top Gun Maverick this year, it's just a random bad guy, this country. Like, it's never named. It's meant to be Russia, you can generally tell, but it's never named as Russia. It's like they don't want to for fear of annoying people. Yeah, and a movie like this or British Agent expects you to know a little bit about what's going on in Russia. Whereas I find when you see Russian stuff later on down the road, it's more as like, it's very like kind of like bullet point stuff. Whereas like you and I both when we were doing British Agent in particular, but this one as well, had to pause and actually start like looking up some history to kind of relate to what the storytelling was telling us. Uh, speak for yourself. I'm recording from a gulag right now. <laughs> I had to laugh at the uh, end of this movie where the czar, you know, lets both the agents off the hook. Uh, he pardons them for their bravery and generosity of love. And I thought, I wonder how many times Putin has let people off for that. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah. It's a different world we live in now, buddy. Bravery and generosity of love, you're good to go. You get out of here, you crazy kids. I, I don't even think that will get you, let you fly in our countries, let alone Russia. No, no. I mean, Canada, we're not too uh, strict, but uh, I think even that one would not fly here. I, I, I've got my issues with that ending, but we'll get to that. Let's mm. talk about the things we like. Let's like these suckers. I liked a lot of things. I will focus on William Powell. I think I, I mentioned on, on sort of my top line, he is a charismatic lead. I wish I could now go and see more of him after this. I, I was genuinely impressed. I think you would really like the Thin Man movies where it's him paired with Myrna Loy, who's also hilarious. One of the great talents of her time as well. And they basically play this kind of like boozy upper class couple that solve m- mysteries. Oh, I quite like the sound of this. Yeah, they're like 90 minutes. The two of them basically just like tease and ridicule each other for 90 minutes and then solve crimes. It's so much fun. So basically you're hanging out with William Powell. And Myrna Loy. And she's amazing. They are just as good as each other. Like they both raise each other's game and they both have that same mastery of like light comedy and kind of this like, oh man, I don't even know what to, a slightly, slightly bumbling uh, upper crust kind of attitude sure 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 i don't even know if yeah i don't even know if bumbling's the right way but kind of this almost like slight obliviousness where like you see him in this movie and he's like waking up or sorry no he's going to bed i should say it's he's like well it's an early night it's 2 a.m don't wake me up till 11 that's kind of the attitude that carries over to those uh thin man movies okay 
All right, I'll I'll, I'll check those out. Uh, some of you liked Cam. I actually really like the chemistry of him and Louise Rayner. Sure. Louise Rayner, I thought was really interesting. I like that there's you know, German actress. So I like that there's a little bit of an exotic feel to her. I don't know that the accent quite lines up with the Russian background of the character, but I thought these two meshed very well as an on-screen couple. And I wasn't super familiar with her. I have seen The Great Sigfield, but I really don't remember that much about it. It is a real sit to get through that one. It's about a three-hour 1930s biopic about a song and dance man and a guy who ran Broadway shows, and it is really dry. One of the toughest Best Picture winners, I think, to revisit now, um, just because of pacing alone. So I really didn't have a great sense of her, but I liked the way they played off each other. And also, I mean, this movie's all about candlesticks getting mixed up. I think that requires a certain nimble on your feet performance style from the actors. You know, you got to have... It's not like screwball comedy dialogue. Like, it's not like rapid-fire zingers. But there's a certain energy to the dialogue you have to have and the way the two of them bounce off each other romantically I think has to be perfectly on cue for this thing to sort of work. And I think they really pull it off. Like a lot of the energy of this movie and I think why it was fun to watch is because of the two of them. No, I I couldn't agree more. My issues with Louise Rayner is more like trying to figure out what she is and what she stands for because she sort of flips on a dime at the end of the film. Yeah. I don't understand. And... Like at one point, it's inferred that she's very young. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, this, the film has an issue with age, but we won't get into that. So, yeah, I, that was more my issue. But I had the camaraderie between the two of them down as one of my likes. So I completely agree with you there. I have some ages, by the way. Louise Rayner was 27, maybe 26 at the time she shot this. Okay. And William Powell would have been about 45. Okay. I, I I assume that was what he was inferring with the age, so that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I mean, I I in terms of like big sweeping likes, I didn't really have any more. We mentioned the cinematography; I think the costuming is pretty fantastic, especially in that opening sequence. I really liked a couple of little things, so I guess I'll talk about that. Yeah. Firstly, is the comedic nature of this film at times. I think it's quite funny. I mean, it, as you say, it's not full screwball comedy. But it is kind of like a chase film in a way. They're, they're, they're trying to hunt something down. And there's like a, a drive behind their mission. There's uh, energy to it all. But there's also moments that are just sort of comical and farcical in nature. Like a lot of the stuff on the train I found to be hilarious. Uh, William Powell walks into the wrong person's room. And he's like, excuse me. <laughs> oh, no, no, excuse me. Sorry. Ugh. Get me out of here. <laughs> this isn't the lady I wanted. With the with the very haggard, probably like forty two year old woman. <laughs> oh, exactly, it looks just like us. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly, exactly like us. It's like replicas. I often I've often been called a forty two year old woman. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that worked for me. And then of course you you've got William Powell thinking he's like snuck away, and then Louise Renner catches up on a different train. It's all it's all kind of like cutesy stuff, it, but it all ties together pretty well. And I think it's acted very well, which you pointed out with the two of them. But I just like that comedic slant to the film i think it gave it a nice bit of energy to help me get through it i also think elements like the candlesticks with the secret compartments that get mixed up one's broken one's not then they're both broken the way that those sorts of plots elements work in kind of add to the comic energy and just the way they like they bounce around you know once they've lost the candlesticks we get a whole montage of them traveling all over europe looking and it's just like elements like that give the movie a lot of energy and just like there's little bits of this movie, like, for example, there's a scene where the two of them are in separate rooms, but they can hear each other through the wall. And they're both <laughs> wanting to like take off and do their own little espionage stuff without the other one knowing. And so they're putting on this overly showy, like clomping around their room, throwing the shoes out the door, squeaking the bed back and forth to try to make it sound like they're going to bed. Stuff like that. It's not played up as like. This is not like Marx Brothers, like, rolling in the aisles comedy, but it's, like, very funny and just kind of, like, you know, low-key humorous. Yeah, and I, I totally got why they were jumping on the bed and the whole point of it. 
I'm not too sure why you insist on doing it every time we share a room, Cam. <laughs> I would kill to see the James Bond movie where Bond has a room next to, like, the villain, and the two of them are, like, jumping on the beds <laughs> to make it sound like they're <laughs> going to sleep. It, it comes up in, like, a, a Friends episode, I think, at one point, and they're trying to outdo each other on sex noises. Uh, was it also in Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Perhaps so. I haven't seen that film. But I... I I, I would like to see Blofeld and Bond going up against each other in sort of a who who can sound like they're having more fun sex in the next room. In this case, though, they were just trying to sound like they were going to sleep, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was more about sleeping, although I would be worried if Blofeld's room, you'd hear the squeaking and then you hear like, meow. <laughs> that or it's him crawling into bed and seeing Irma Bunt laying there suddenly <laughs> revealed, like on Her Majesty's, like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> With the extreme light on her face. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, dreaming about chicken flesh. <laughs> I thought another scene in this movie that was really good was this is a spy trope that you don't see in modern spy films so much, but in older ones is becoming very common, which is the auction house scene. Oh, they love an auction house scene. We've seen, this is, I think, the third one we've come across now. It might be fourth. Uh, we had North by Northwest, and what was the other one? There was a couple others. One was recent, too. I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but there's been at least three. The 355 had one as well. Are you saying someone remembered the 355? Well, we edited out the part where I was racking my brain trying to remember what it was. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people edited out the 355 from their <laughs> memories. But yeah, like uh, scenes like that were a lot of fun. Um this movie has moments like that. I even kind of like the subplot with, um, you know, Louise Rayner's character, uh, Countess Olga Marinova's uh, maid, who is stealing jewelry from her. Mm. And the way that factors into the complication and the maid's no good boyfriend uh, as well is involved. And I mean, it just kind of adds to the energy of the movie. Absolutely. And, and another quick thing I wanted to just tip my hat to, it's, it's a little touch. And the only reason it jumped out to me is because literally the other day I had watched The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. And in that film, it starts off with Sean Connery and the rest of his submarine talking in Russian. And then Sam Neill's character is reading a book and they zoom in and they change from Russian to English because he's reading the book and he's translating what he's saying. And that's how they sort of deal with the fact that Sean Connery is talking in a Scottish accent. I think we're going to see that again in Valkyrie as well. Sure. The reason I mention this is because in this film they do something similar. They show a sign that's in, uh, I believe it's in Russian. I could be incorrect. I'm sorry if I'm saying the wrong language. But then it translates it to English for you, like whilst looking at the sign. I think that was quite cool. Yeah, that was that was effective. Like it helped explain why no one's accents line up with uh, where they would be from, <laughs> even close. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no one near at all. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, 2023 just got a little dirtier because we are going to tackle the fourth Dirty Harry thriller, Sudden Impact from 1983. It's going to make your day. And if that sounds delicious then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spy but before this message self-destructs cam resume the spy jinx but let's uh let's talk about some things that we didn't like let's send this film to siberia as it were i mean we've already pointed out the pre-reading requires i don't really want to bag on that anymore i think it's annoying that this film needs context to enjoy but ultimately i i don't blame them for thinking people should know stuff because at the time most people would have known the answers to these questions that we don't know so that's fine what i want to take aim at 
is the lack of consequence in the film. Yeah. It's all fun and games, and they get to the end, and there's this emotional scene where William Powell has found out that uh, Louise Rayner's countess is a spy. They both found out each other are spies, but you know William Powell's character has the upper hand, and he decides he wants to do the good thing and basically take her life into his hands and save her, but it will more or less cost him his life. Yeah. Pretty heavy stakes. Kind of a cool revelation. He goes to Russia, gets in trouble, gets arrested by this like chief of police or something like that. That's and it's played quite serious. And as you mentioned, the Tsar just says, "Ah, ah, you're all good. You're a nice bloke. Get back to Poland with you." I mean, I guess it's because they saved his son, right? Yeah, but he didn't do it. No, that's true. He didn't. But uh, well, he had to deliver the letter, right? Yeah, he delivered the letter. So that kind of led to the son being freed. Sure. I I I just found that to be a bit of a bump on me. I have to say, like I I I wouldn't have minded if it ended a bit darker. It's weird because like I think the ramifications for the two of them, where they could be facing like a firing squad or something at the end, doesn't really line up with what the movie's doing. The rest of it, like no. early on, when you have this uh, you know Polish nationalist group kidnap, you know the Tsar's son. It's not played as particularly scary. Like, they basically take him to this, you know, whatever it is, private residence. He's kind of living in luxury. You see him hanging out with, you know, the uh, Frank Morgan character. They're not exactly suffering. They're not being tortured for information. It's a very kind of like, you can see how this is kind of like a light comedy in many ways. Like, it's not portrayed as these two are in danger. And it's really just about having an exchange to release, you know, this leader, this Polish leader who's being held by the Russians. So you're like, okay, cool. It's all very like kind of this civil espionage going on. The fact that they have these two agents who are kind of these upper crust agents who deck themselves out in, you know, dress, uh, you know, outfits and like fancy jewelry. There's no real sense of danger in the espionage here. Mm -hmm. So it is a little weird that they are being threatened with like being you know, executed at the end, which is why I would almost take away the darker element and have that fairy tale ending because the whole thing feels kind of fairy tale. Like nothing about this really speaks to the modern real world. I I agree with you. I just wouldn't have had that scene where William Powell says how dangerous it's going to be, and she says, "Oh no, you shouldn't do it because you'll you'll get killed." Yeah. Don't don't set up these sweeping stakes and be like, actually, the stakes don't matter. Well, and it has like, and I remember when we talked about some of the like '80s movies, like the fairy tale ending. Like this movie has a fairy tale ending, sure, where the czar is just like, "Oh, you guys, you know, he's he's just like he's almost like Boss Nass in the Star Wars Episode <laughs> One film. He's just like, yeah. Whoa, you know, you guys go off and be crazy, whatever." Uh, and then it cuts to them like driving along, um, engaged, being like, "Well, all our troubles are over." Oh, really, honey? You said you'd marry me. Your troubles are far from over. <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. Credits. Like, it's not a movie that I, I get they wanted to establish stakes, but I would have honestly just pivoted it so it's like they would just never be able to see each other again. Yeah, like they they had to stay in their respective home countries. Yeah. Which is, again, tying back to the Romeo and Juliet of it all, the sort of star-crossed lovers. They could have gone down that angle because they spent the whole film setting up Romeo and Juliet but they didn't. I don't think it hurts the movie too much. I think, to me, my biggest concern about the movie, in terms of recommending it to people to watch, is that, like, it's a movie that could be a little bit confusing in the storytelling. And this mm -hmm. is supposed to be a very kind of, like, light escapade movie that, in theory, it's for everyone. It's for, you know, ages, you know, across the board to sit down and enjoy this movie. And I do think, like, it gets pretty muddled early on where it gets a little tough to track what's going on. And I think that might lose some people. And it's a movie that depends on sort of that comic energy that they want you to have a good time. Like, this is a movie that is not trying to... It's not even British Agent. British Agent was a little more serious in terms of what it was tackling. This movie's not particularly serious. It wants you to just have fun with these characters. And I think sometimes the storytelling interferes with your ability to just kind of hang, hang out and have fun with the characters. I agree. I think that's more of a case of, you know, public knowledge at the time. 
I don't know if it necessarily holds it back in that sense for me. I, I don't mind them having expectations of the viewer. I just feel like it's it's a shame they had to lean on that crutch because what it does is it's like it's inbuilt motivation. You know what someone from Poland's going to be acting towards right? because they're from Poland at that time. But whereas if they made this film now, you'd have to spend several lines of dialogue to be like, oh, I don't like the Russians because X. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, hey-ho. I did want to mention in things I disliked, and that is uh, whoever whoever recommended Louise Rayner goes to the eye-acting college <laughs> because, boy, oh, boy, she is laying it on thick with her eye acting they know that she's got big eyes they are really focusing on that but it's every shot is just of her like staring she barely blinks and uh i watched this film twice in one day i can tell you she really barely blinks (laughs) i thought she had quite an impression though on screen like i've seen many movies of these past eras where one of the party you know whether it's the male lead or the female lead one of them's a little stiff there's a lot of kind of like blind leading men and there's a lot of, you know, ingenues who are being put as leads of movies of this time that didn't really perform at a high level. Uh, I thought she was pretty memorable, though. I thought she was fun. She had kind of that similar kind of like almost like um, Greta Garbo, Hedy Lamar kind of quality where like they feel kind of like, you know, foreign stars coming into Hollywood movies, but they kind of leap out for that reason. And they seem really interesting to watch on screen. Uh, I don't think she's quite at the level of those two in terms of kind of that, the ability to kind of cast a spell over an audience. But I thought she was effective enough. And she felt like someone who would be an agent from another world that would not necessarily mesh in normal circumstances with William Powell's character. No, absolutely. She felt like she was a fleshed out character in a world that we're not too familiar with the world uh it was very interesting i I think her performance was fine i just i don't know i just think she grated on me a little bit and i think the story was confused as to what she wanted because she spent most of the film trying to take down this guy and then just flipped i think the key to it though is that moment at the dinner table where they're talking about loneliness yeah and the fact that they both live these kind of high class lifestyles in some ways and they're involved in the espionage game but they're both very lonely people and i think that's maybe where the switch gets flipped and and of course you rewatched that scene about five times (laughs) i memorized it acted it out myself uh (laughs) head to the spy hards youtube for my one man show (laughs) into a mirror talking about how lonely cam is (laughs) but it's like um i do cuts where it's me dressed in the different clothing of each of the stars (laughs) Yes, exactly. And you're doing uh, Louise Rayner's eye acting as well as... Uh, <laughs> uh, you also get to do the masquerade stuff, which I think was quite cool. Yes, that, that's true. Although you making out with yourself in the mirror as both Juliet and Romeo was a bit strange. <laughs> I had a question for you. Have we seen many other examples of like these like high-class lifestyle spies? Because both these you know leads are coming from these like luxurious worlds and... That's not something we come across too often of like the spy world being filled with people who are like loaded with money. Well, you say that, but I think British agent, we're getting our agents again. He was very much an aristocrat. I got the the sense. He was living in an embassy. He was sort of flown around the world. I got that impression. Yeah. Other than that, no. Yeah, because you have like William Powell's a baron. And Louise Rayner's character is a countess. So, like, they are real upper crust. Yeah, the other answer I think I can come up with is with a lot of these 60 spies, like the liquidator and stuff, they all seem to live these hedonistic lifestyles that require quite a lot of resources. It's just how we perceive money in these films is different to how it was in the 60s. In these days, in the 1930s, it was all about the sort of aristocratic lifestyle. You have a butler and stuff but you look at like Derek Flint has four and five live-in servants at one point that he's I assume giving a payment to all of them it's true yeah and also like Matt Helm clearly has money as well yeah um I'm not sure what the liquidate the liquidate was funded by other people to be fair yeah um if we're just gonna sort of spiral off into sort of final notes I have a couple myself please firstly 
there's a little bit of connective tissue to uh, 1987's The Living Daylights. Okay. It takes place at the beginning of the uh, the masquerade ball in a opera house in Vienna. Oh yeah, yeah, good call, good call. Yeah, uh, I was I was looking out for uh, old Cara Malovi sitting in the uh, in the rafter somewhere with a sniper rifle, trying to check it, <laughs> take out Romeo. Because <laughs> there's a whole balcony thing, isn't there? When they're in the the box, looking down on the other box, it's all there with Bond there sitting is, in the yeah. box. I might even put a post up online of the two boxes next to each other. I can only imagine the flood of likes that are going to come in for that one. (laughs) (laughs) That's very true. The other one I had, um, and this is just regarding something we haven't really spoken about, which is the the thing this film is named after, the candlesticks themselves. Yeah. We should probably take a couple of minutes to talk about the old candlesticks. For those who haven't seen the film, the candlesticks, probably should have said this up front, have a secret compartment inside of them. It's not particularly like high tech. It's quite lo fi spy work, which is quite fun actually. I- I'm not too sure how much of a purpose they would serve. Like, it's a place to hide stuff, but like, there's a lot of things you can hide. I guess it's hard to find the mechanism. I suppose that's the point. Yeah, I think it's just a novelty for the uh, very rich person that would have these silver candlesticks that, like, they have a little secret compartment, which is kind of fun. Yeah. My question was, and something to sort of discuss for a second, because this obviously comes from a book. I haven't read the original book. I don't know if... But you will be. The ori- I, I, it's literally right next to me, right next to my copy of Little Drummer Girl. Good, because when we do the commentary, Scott will have read the original story of the Emperor's Candlesticks and will bring all of his insight and knowledge to it. I'll be doing it in its original Austrian. <laughs> you have like a monocle on while you're reading it. <laughs> Why is that what you think about when you think of Austrians? <laughs> it's not so much Austrians. I just like to imagine you reading it with a monocle on. Just a monocle. Yeah, just the yeah, just the <laughs> monocle. <laughs> it took you it was like a beat there to get that. <laughs> oh boy. Um. Well, you can enjoy that thought, listeners. But I, I was just curious. Of, I wonder where that concept came from because it's such a weird thing. It's not something you would, like, in everyday life go, oh, that candlestick, I wonder if I could hide a note in it. Yeah. Like, where did I, I'd love to know where that concept came from. I, I imagine the author's long dead now, but... <laughs> oh, it, yeah. It, it, I, I imagine it, it probably was a real thing because it feels so unbelievable. Like, it had to have happened. Well, it's like, I feel like there was a period in time in the past where, like, the idea of, like, little secret compartments was something that, like, was very appealing, exciting to people. There was only mm-hmm. so many entertainment sources. So if you had like, you know, like a, I don't know, like a music box with like a secret compartment, things like that were kind of cool. So that part, I it made sense to me that especially like someone very rich who has these candlesticks, it's like a little novelty that makes it extra neat to show people. So that made sense. I was honestly making the note of, Scott, if you and I have endless amounts of uh, money would these be now the two spy props that we would be the most likely to buy in an auction of all places? Yeah, yeah. I, I if the if somehow MGM <laughs> hadn't destroyed these suckers or repurposed them immediately afterwards, I would I would pick them up. No kidding, right? If we each got one of the Emperor's candlesticks, like yeah, the he- the heck with all like the uh, the Bond stuff. Um, I don't want a golden gun. Who cares? We'll launch the Emperor's Candlesticks Lifestyle YouTube channel. <laughs> the sartorial side of the Emperor's Candlesticks. <laughs> today, folks, on today, folks on Spy Hards, I have the latest masquerade masks. <laughs> we go uh, like jet setting across uh, Europe, recreating <laughs> moments from uh, the Emperor's Candlesticks. <laughs> There's like a real quick montage of going to London with a shot of Big Ben. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Throwing suitcases out the windows of trains. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully we get forgiven him when we go to Russia. Hopefully, hopefully. Although yeah. he may just let us off for um <laughs> bravery and generosity of love. <laughs> I often am described as having those uh, qualities, Cam. That's right. That's right. Oh, I can't wait to start this uh this uh, lifestyle channel now. I really I really want to invest time into it. <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the first thing that we like get a, a deal on? Oh, there's no deals. <laughs> we ain't getting anything. <laughs> With our three viewers? <laughs> Stop calling us, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, they'll be flooding us with requests. <laughs> uh. We are not getting a Manscaped uh, sponsorship on that one. <laughs> no. No. Uh, I... <laughs> well, what about you, Cam? Do you have any final notes? I had a couple things. Uh, one of them was um, they keep referring to the Walensky papers, which are the papers that would uh, incriminate William Powell's character. Whenever they said Walensky papers, I immediately thought of the Penske file from Seinfeld. Is that when he like doesn't actually get the job, but he turns up for two weeks before the boss comes back from holiday and he just starts working there, basically? No, no, it's where he's actually working on the Penske file. He's given the job and they're like, okay, you have to uh, oversee the Penske file. And he's like, uh, okay. And then they just keep asking him, like, so how's the Penske file going? He's like, oh, hard at work, hard at work on the Penske file. And he has no idea what his job is supposed to be. Okay. Uh, well, that sounds like us every week, to be fair. That's true. Um, there was another part that made me laugh, which is the letter that um, Robert Young's character sends that uh, is forced to write out that is going to be transported um, to the Russians, which he you know, writes out exactly what's happening to him and how they need to make the switch to save his life. But he ends it with, Your Majesty's Obedient Son... <laughs> I feel like if my father got a letter saying from your majesty's obedient son, he'd be like, he didn't write this. <laughs> your parents are dead. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, that's uh, laying it on a little too thick. <laughs> uh, not on top of the list of uh, upcoming Bond titles. <laughs> and I think the only other thing that jumped out to me was that I actually appreciated, which is when we have the czar show up at the end of the movie. He's hidden like Blofeld in the early Bond films where you don't actually see him. It's just guy in big chair seen from behind the chair. I, I like that. Well, here's a question for you then. If the Russian czar is Blofeld, what is his pet? Oh, boy. What, what kind of animals are like native to Russia that would really leap out to the viewer? Wolves? Yeah, you know what? Like a Siberian Husky, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I mean, that was a... I was aiming for like a jokey answer, but that's actually probably the best answer. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> ah, you really brought the tone up, Cam. <laughs> I, I did have another question for you, actually, though. Uh-huh. This movie, we tackle spy films. Is this a good spy story? Are these two interesting spy characters? Now it's too late to be asking these questions, Cam. We, we've already gone too far down the well with the men in blacks and stuff. We can't be too <laughs> critical. No, no, I'm not critical of covering the movie on the show. I mean in the sense of when you watch this movie, do you feel like this is an interesting portrayal of spycraft? I think at times, yes. The stuff with the notes is pretty cool, and they're trying to both sneak stuff past each other. I yeah. mean, they're, they're pretty inept spies, but we're used to that. Yeah, like that's where I was a little unclear, because... They both are like working for high ranking organizations, but you don't get the sense of kind of that like real professionalism you see in so many of these types of movies. Um, it's obviously like a very frothy romantic comedy type sure, of sure. film, but I, I was, um, I did kind of walk away from the movie going like, I don't know that this is the most compelling portrait of uh, spycraft for these kind of 1930s movies we've tackled. Ironically, it's probably more likely to be correct though. Yeah, that's also quite possible. Yeah. Okay, Cam, question time. The Emperor's Candlestick. Is it making the knock list? No, I don't think so. I think the fact that this movie's been kind of forgotten kind of speaks to maybe how much weight it has out there. I think it's one, though, that people sh who are looking for more of like that kind of fun, light, you know, older spy film should check out. I think it's a better movie than like British Agent which I think had real pacing issues, as I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one is, it's a star vehicle. And if you want to tune in, kind of have a fun, bubbly time with two big stars of their day for 90 minutes, it works. But when we look at like what movies belong on the all-time great spy films, I'm totally open to including like something like this, but I don't think this one is quite good enough an example of what it is to deserve to be recognized as one of the all-time greats. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to go much further than what we've already said. I think there's 
I think it, this film does some really cool, interesting stuff. It's quite nice to see these spies fighting each other and going against one another and and not in a physical way like you would with Bond films. It's more about trying to outthink and outspy each other. I quite like that. But I think there's too many flaws inside of this story. There's problems with its structure. There's problems with you requiring background reading and it's not giving you the expository dump to sort of explain stuff. So you have to sort of stop and read, which is not something you should be doing with a film. It should be sort of a a capsule, really, and and, and work on its own two legs. So I think if you're asking me some of my favorites of the 30s, I'm not even sure it would be there because I think I would go straight to Hitchcock. Do you think this movie is better than Matahari? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Matahari has a better second half. And I think it has a much better lead. But this film has a better it's like co-stars and background actors and uh, you know other actors, basically. Matahari is the Greta Garbo show. Yeah, totally. Like this has like the kind of the the production value that I think, you know, you were saying it up front, like early on in the show, you know, when we started this podcast, you were like, are these 1930s movies going to feel really creaky? I think you could watch this one as a modern viewer and not feel like it's dragging at all. Like it definitely moves for 90 minutes straight. I think it's very well paced. I'm not too sure I'm in 100% agreement with you. I think the pacing is a bit rocky at times, but it's it's much better paced than I thought films of this era were, personally mm. speaking. And so I'm happy with it in that sense. But if it's if it's the question of it's going to go on the knock list, of, you know, the list of the greatest spy films of all time, unfortunately it's a no. But it is one I'm glad I got a chance to watch. And I would recommend, you know, more of the, the spy hards out there, as it were, the people who want to watch everything with us or try to, I would say go out of your way to try and find it. Hopefully it's still on YouTube by the time we put this out, and, I, and hopefully I'll have a link in the show notes for everyone. I think it's worth checking out, I don't, but it's definitely not the greatest spy film of all time. If only to support our Emperor's Candlesticks Experience podcast. Exactly, yeah. The sartorial side of Masquerade Balls in Vienna. That's right, that's right. Well, there you go, folks. Unfortunately, it is not the Emperor's Sacred Candlesticks. Oh, Matt Ahari reference for you old timers out there. <laughs> oh, the people that have been following along this whole time get the sacred candle reference. I'm surprised we didn't bring it up in the show. Yeah. But hey, we, we finally had the, the film to connect it because we could put our sacred candles in our emperor's candlestick. That's right. That's right. I mean, I'll be curious how many movies we tackle in the future made around this time period that cross into whether it's Matt Ahari or this film. Yeah, well, we already pointed out in the beginning, or you did, certainly, that there are connective people and connective tissues to, to Matt Ahari. So I'm not surprised that there's a much smaller pond back in those days. But yeah, as it stands, two no's, and as such, the Emperor's Candlesticks is not making the knock list. Cam, question goes to you, sir. What on earth are we talking about next week? We're not doing a review episode next week, folks. We are releasing our interview with Gloria Hendry, who you may know as Rosie Carver from Live and Let Die. We are super psyched to have this interview, and we can't wait for you to hear it. Yeah, it's a very, very exciting one this week. Uh, It's um, not often you get to speak to such a high caliber when it comes to James Bond alumni. So I know you'll all enjoy it. And she's actually here to talk about not just Live and Let Die, but we do definitely get into that. But also her new book, Gloria Hendry, 007 Bond Bunny, Black Renaissance IFM, which will be information about in the show notes below next week, which you can check out as well. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out the Gloria Hendry interview. All you Roger Moore Live and Let Die fans will definitely dig this one, baby. If you liked what you heard on the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next time, listeners, there's much to be said for trousers. (laughs) We'll be right back. 